it, like he is. He's been there thereabouts in the last few years. And same with John, his brother, obviously Joseph is as an established senior in the Galway team. But last year I thought was the year Kevin Cooney really nailed down a I wouldn't even say nailed down a spot. And it was even something that Henry Shefflin uh, mentioned as well. He nailed down a position in attack, but had the versatility that they could move him around as, yeah. as need be, which must be absolutely invaluable and at any team or at any time, but certainly in the modern era where you know, you have that con continuous movement in it. So, like, he was a nailed-on starter in the Galway attack this year, and now he may make the last bit of it. I, I think Henry Shefflin summed it up when he said, look, if this happened two weeks from now, he'd be ruled out for the year. So what's he telling us? He's going to be back for an All-Ireland final if they get there. The Maroon and White pod brought to you by CityLink. For bookings, timetables, updates, and any other information, head to citylink.ie. So on this week's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by sports journalist John Fallon to look back on Goy's comfortable victory over Westmead in the opening round of the National Hurling League, where Goy ran out uh, winners on a scoreline of 431 to 12 points. John, before we get into the game, just from reading the match reports um, that you did on that, that particular game over the weekend... 700 tickets sold before the match. It was really that was really kind of eye opening for a uh, opening game in the Alliance Hurling League where usually you'd have a lot of excitement about the season get going. Yeah, you, you've absolutely. I was, I, I must say, I wasn't surprised by it. I, in, in a way, I was nearly surprised there were 700 people willing to fork out and travel across Galway City on a Saturday afternoon. Um, you know, because it was so inevitable what the outcome was going to be. So on the pitch, it was a difficult sell. And then I think off the pitch, it was also a difficult sell in terms of the lack of promotion around the both of the leagues. Like the previous week, you had uh, Damien Comer of Galway and Killian O'Connor of Mayo were the only put players put forward. Uh, Damien Comer didn't even play in the match. Killian O'Connor didn't start it. And I think this week we had somebody from tip and somebody from Kilkenny. I, I don't even remember. That's a Richie Reed was up on one of them. But mm. it's just every year just that lack of promotion nationally and the lack of promotion locally as well. And you know it was only afterwards um in I think we did an interview with Henry Shefflin for five minutes after the match, most of which was dominated by local radio. And um it was only an afterthought I asked him, you know, had he had he decided on a captain for the year? And we were informed that Conor Whelan has become the Galway captain and Conor Cooney has become the vice captain and Dahi Burke is no longer the captain. And I think at about 10 o'clock on Saturday night, it was tweeted that Galway had appointed a new captain. And you're just sort of thinking, you know, imagine if you'd brought that back a bit further at the start of the week and maybe had something in Kinvara, because maybe, I'm not sure whether Connor is the first Kinvara man to captain Galway on, on a, for a season. I'm, I'm sure maybe Jerry Mack or Colin Callan may have done it, at, you know, for a one-off match or any of that. But imagine a scenario where you had a new Galway captain being unveiled in his home village and maybe Connor Cooney coming across from Thomas's and a bit of hype and a bit of, it should mean something. It should yeah. mean something to be made captain of Galway rather than it just being announced in an afterthought. And equally so, the, the new captain of Galway, I think, should step forward. I know um, one of the lads from Galway Bay asked him for an interview on the way in, and it was declined. And you're just sort of thinking, you know, don't be surprised if you get small crowds, if you're not willing to make an effort to, to, to actually sell the product that we all love. We all love watching. We're all part of it. But... I would say there's people heard that scoreline last Saturday and realised for the first time that Galway had started their league campaign for the new year. So I do think there's an onus nationally. I think there's an even bigger onus locally. And I think there's an onus around the team itself, both hurling and football. And we see it, you know, we'll say with Connacht Rugby, which has won one trophy in 130 years. Uh, but like all the rugby team, and I know because I'm working all of that, and look at the level of promotion they do amongst all their players and you know, nobody that's ever stepped forward and done an interview has ever gone out and played badly or... I don't know why. I don't know why, because they're confident as players. I would imagine they're, you know, they're intelligent people as well. And I think the GA needs to wake up and and 
see what's happening. Now, I, I, just one other part of the product. There was a, a thing before the game where one of the Galway players went down injured and he was coming off and none of us in the press box recognised him. We couldn't see his number. His helmet was off. And I asked the other guys, you know, there'd be more involved with club and stuff like that. We don't know who he was. And I think it's an indictment in many ways, you know, that you have somebody playing for Galway and the people locally who are reporting on it don't even, can't even recognise him. Like he obviously had stepped forward, but because players are wearing helmets and face guards and we only ever get to see them when they're out on the pitch, they become absolutely anonymous when they take off the number or any of that. It's, um, you know, hopefully we will in, in that part of it. And just, there was, I was reading something last week that, it, again, I think should be a wake-up call. And when we talk about the GA nationally, I think we're talking about it locally even more so because they're in a position to go and do something about all this. But last year, more people, more, the television viewing audience for Ireland and Tonga was bigger than watch the what watch the All Ireland hurling final, and um, like that's crazy stuff. So, as you said, the opening part of it seven hundred. Not even sure if there was seven hundred there. Maybe if you you see you can't you don't amble up either. You got to buy a ticket in advance. I know there is some sort of mechanism you can do all of that, but it's not it's not exactly very easy or friendly. It's not encouraging somebody walking the prom to suddenly go up on because they don't know whether they can get a ticket or not into it as well. So. That part of it, obviously, who they were playing Saturday afternoon, um, an inevitable outcome. Um, like that Westmeath team, they had only about half. Of, yeah, they were down twelve players or something, wasn't it? Well, I think I was trying to work it out. The team that beat Wexford in the championship last year, I think there were there were eight of the team that started against Wexford did not start. Last okay. week, around about half or whatever. Mm-hmm. Spoke to Joe Fortune, their manager afterwards, and he was he was going through them. He nearly has all of that squad. David Lennon, who uh, obviously from from this parish, as it were, he's injured at the moment, but he's he's very much a part of. It. I think they've they've lost uh, just Derek McNicholas, who may come back again as he usually does, or Niall O'Brien. So they've a lot of that, but they were they were very under strength, and there was three or four of those their players making their league debuts at that level, um. As well, so it wasn't even the strongest Westmeath team, and we saw last year. I think Galway played Westmeath, if I'm not mistaken, three times, and beat them sort of 25, 30 points each time. So, uh, a very low key start, and uh, it was noticed with with Shefflin after he was quite annoyed with the performance. You win by thirty one yeah. points, and he's still annoyed in it. And both he and his players are in sort of a no win scenario because. If they only won by a point, there'd be all oh, alarm bells, all sorts of stuff going off, or heaven forbid they'd been beaten or anything. And then just by winning by a major score, I think the first thing they'd be looking at is all the goal chances they left behind them rather than the four they got. So it's it just, just a very, very flat occasion, a very, very flat start, what essentially is the 2024 season. And suddenly it gets... Turned on his head and you got to go to Thurless next Sunday. And uh, that was no preparation for going to Thurless next Sunday. I think Shefflin knew that and I think his, his players knew it as well. So it, it just all in all was just, um, it was very hard to get excited about last Saturday. And I don't think any of us did, to be perfectly honest. Uh, absolutely. From being there too, uh, I was on the terrace and I think he could nearly spot everyone who was on the terrace. And there was such a small crowd at that game it's probably a bit disappointing in one sense John because they only get one more home game this year in the league obviously with away games against uh, Antrim um, Limerick and obviously Tip then next Sunday like Dublin I think at the start of March is going to be their last home game of the uh, National League yeah and like the league as we know is being restructured I'm not so sure uh, I'm not so sure they're going to find the right solution either. It's actually hard enough to follow an awful lot of it. Mm. But you know, you look at it, you want to, on one hand, you want to promote um you want to widen the hurling family, as they might call it. There's just far too many counties playing it, far too many at a competitive level. We'd all the hoo-ha about five teams not even at one stage going in to participate in in, in this league. Um I think if we look at the football equivalent, we see where the National Football League across all four divisions is actually very, very good competition. 
Yeah. Even if, if it's Division 3, Division 4, Division 2 is probably the best of the whole lot of them. You have teams going up, teams going down. We saw it with Galway in the last couple of years. And, you know, you speak to somebody like Andy Morden and Leach, and he'll tell you, this is our championship. You know, it's the National League is the championship for Leach. And that's where they have a chance to win matches. That's where they can do stuff. Um, they know their, their championship is going to be limited within it. But what you generally tend to get is, most matches or a lot of matches are quite even. Uh, it's almost like they're handicapped properly. It's like it, within them. But in hurling, it's the other way because there probably aren't enough teams uh, at that level. But maybe there are the old way where they had basically six teams or in the Division 1 and you had six in Division 2. And those six in Division in uh, Division 1, six or eight, whatever it might be, would all tend to be, you know, you'd have Cork playing Wexford, Limerick playing Clare, so on and so forth. They'd all be even matches. You might get one, you know, odd team in it, or more to the point you'd get maybe a strong team in Division 2. But it tended, I thought, to lead to a higher standard of game and it, better teams. I thought it helped develop hurling in a lot of the other counties, the West Meats, the Antrims, the Leashes. A lot of these, I thought, improved an awful lot more from having balanced games. Like, you know, Westmeath losing by 31 points the last day. They're playing Limerick this weekend. I surely, just on that, on Saturday, I don't think that stands to go or Westmeath when we just consider the game that was there. It was we're probably, for Westmeath, we're probably happy in one sense with the first half when you see 15-6, but then when you see the final scoreline, like, that's not bringing Westmeath on really. And is it bringing the ball on? Of course not. How could it be? They, they actually had a... Now, if, again, the, their manager, Joe Fortune, was saying at least this year with no relegation, there's no jeopardy. It allows him actually go and send out essentially a half-cent team against Galway, knowing they're going to get a hammer. Um, And he, he more or less said, whether we send out our strongest team or a half-team, we're going to get a hammering anyway. So we may as well learn from that. And there was one, like David O'Reilly came on score two points. That was the league debut. And for a player like that to come on against, you know, Galway and get two good points from play and look look fairly sharp, I thought, as well, that's going to help him an awful lot. But who was the Galway player that benefited from that, that, you know, would say, we can go out and do that next week? And it's impossible to find one, to be perfectly honest. You know, it's... it's um, in terms of developing a settled team, now we still have a few more players to come back into it and you have the Thomas's lads or whatever. But this league clicks along very quickly. As he said, there's only one more home match, uh, uh, two more away ones after after next weekend. And then you're into championship. And how many of that Galway team that started last Saturday, how many of the one against Wexford the previous week, at what stage do you stop sort of experimenting is TJ Brennan going to be your full back for the year? Or is it almost the inevitable going to happen that Dahi Burke will slot back there and Jerry McInerney will come into centre back? Um, you're running out of, even though it's only started, you're almost running out of games to actually decide, you know, who's who's ready for, for stuff like that. So nobody benefits, um, certainly not Galway, certainly not Galway. I think Shefflin could see that. You know, the the Noel Thomasy, the Westmeath goalkeeper was I, I my man of the match anyway. I thought he was outstanding some of the saves he produced. But you know, had Galway scored 10 goals, would they be happy? And that's what they should have done. There was six yeah. point blank saves, I thought, that another day a lesser goalie would not would not have saved them. But is that the second of, of three penalties so far this year that's been missed as well? You know, I, I think that's where the frustration from Shefflin, and I think from a lot of the Galway supporters that were there as well, like this all flow into it. You know, we didn't need last Saturday to show us that Evan Island is one of the best free takers in the country and he's your nailed on. He he can do it. Uh, is he still going to be the free taker when Connie Co Connor Cooney comes back, who's now the vice captain? I don't know. You know, so it's, it's I think we'll be an awful lot wiser after, after next Sunday, you know, and I think a lot of guys... The the higher tempo against Tipperary, I think, will suit an awful lot of Galway players as well because they're more accustomed to playing at that level than the last day. And as you said, Westmead, in fairness, they hurled very well, I thought, in the first half against the Breeze. Yet half an ocean if they're going to score at the start or two at the second half, could there be could there be something on here? But 
I think they emptied the tank in that opening half and trying to contain Galway and uh, then just the floodgates. And in fairness, Galway hurled the hurled better against the wind. And I think I think we always knew they would. It was holding up that bit better. That often like that, the better team in a mismatch will do better against the wind than than actually with it. And and so it transpired. But you know, they they couldn't win, they couldn't lose. They had to go out and put up a big score. They put up a very big score, and yet there could be very little satisfaction out of it either. And and that was uh, Henry Sheffield set that tone himself afterwards more so than anybody else. Is there any kind of positives that we can take away from it, or and did I it stood out to you? I mean, you had what was the twelve players scored? You know, guys like Donald O'Shea, Gavin Lee. I thought it a good games. Um, Sean Lennon into there. Tom Monaghan looked looked to be back through it as well. Um, on another day, Declan McLaughlin would have got a couple of those goals. Yeah. Uh, he got a bit of a knock, came off. He's playing Fitzgibbon uh, again, then they're trying to, to manage their way through that. I, what we want to see is we want to see these players on Thurless next Sunday. And yeah. that's when you start seeing. So I suppose you'd say to put it a different way, you'd say, well, if they can't stand out against Westmeath, having to hope in hell against, of doing it against Tipperary, in fairness, Galway hurled very well and, and, to chalk up that score. It's just who it was against meant there was more question marks than anything else. Like there is there is actually a very, very exciting squad there for Galway. Like when you when you look at what's there and you look, we'll say the Thomas's lads and you've the 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 likes of, of Jerry McInerney and a few more of these, Colin Mannion, he was the, the Mayorishka the last day, a lot of these lads yet to come back into it and you say you know there is a there is a good 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 squad there, but what you need to do now between now and the Leinster Championship is gel that into not even a fifteen because it's it's more than that now. But who's who's sort of your first twenty, and who are your main positions into that? And there's a short run again. It's it, you know it's an exciting time because there is everybody knows there's a serious squad there. Um, it's just to get the quality of games to actually you know, really gel that together. And as I said, it, it's next Sunday that will start telling us a bit more about that. Two younger players you mentioned there, Gavin Lee, I thought was exceptional at the weekend. You can tell as well during this off season, he's really put on a bit of size um, compared to when he started out in this panel. But it's a good, I think he scored was it five points the last different play, really popped up. I'm down for four. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. five been four, I could be wrong there now. Yeah, yeah. But, um, He's he's really started this uh, season well. Absolutely, absolutely, and like he's a guy, you know, he, he it's a few years now since he came into it. And he was brought in so young, and then, you know, I I've, some sometimes for college and sometimes for Clareton Bridge or whatever. And you were just, I just always felt there was a lot of there was a huge level of expectation around him, and that was often diff- sometimes difficult to see within that. That you know was was. Were they looking to carry this through in it? And I thought as well against Leash in, in the Walsh Cup, and he, he formed a very good um, partnership with Don Loche that day as well. Loche is, you know, is that his position as well? Like he's delivered an awful lot of quality ball. I think if we go back to that Leash match, if I'm not mistaken, he was he was the the final pass or the key pass in four of the goals that day. Um that's the, the thing with John O'Shea, though, isn't it? It's his distribution that just puts oh, him on another level. Absolutely, like his that would the delivery for Jason Flynn's opening goal the last day. Um, to me, it looked absolutely purposeful. He, he that wasn't a shot for a point, drop and short. That mm. was just the way he lobbed that in. In fairness to Flynn, he finished it, finished it magnificently. But go back to Gavin Lee. I think yes, physically and everything. Um, and I thought that sort of. Given him that bit of roaming space as well, you could see why everybody has been so excited about him coming right up. Um, personally, I didn't always see that. Maybe it was just the matches I was covering, whether it was up and down or whatever. Um, you could see that developing, and like what an exciting prospect it would be if you know this is the year he he comes through as as a senior there and and certainly in fairness to to Henry Shefton and his management they're giving him that space and, and they're giving that space to O'Shea. I'm really looking forward to seeing them next Sunday and hopefully they're there and get get that opportunity to go with it. And similarly likes of Declan McLaughlin as well that 
you know, he goal, we need goals and they need championship goals and they can't be dependent upon Conor Whelan producing that sort of trademark goal that he got the last day. Um, they need others getting in there and scoring those. So those, there's a lot of excitement around the team. You know, as I said, the the you go back like Keenan Fahey is right half back has has turned in a few great performances as well. You know, he really looks at. Uh, we were only referencing him with Sir Farrell there two weeks ago. He's talking about the Walsh Cup, but Keenan Fahey since he's moved back to the half back line, he's just looked a different player. Yeah, we and we've seen that before in other players where they're actually facing the ball. Yeah, it is really really the the revel within that part of it and going forward like what was he doing up there to finish home the rebound for the goal it, yeah. it, it, like it looks like he was hanging out there at corner forward as well I, I certainly didn't see him making a run right through to it but his, his positioning positioning to take quick puck outs and everything it, uh, it helped the corpse his brother was in goal as well there were, there were, but his I, I just again he's another player I'm dying to see him I'm dying to see him tested in the likes of Simple Stadium or down in the Gaelic grounds or when you go into Leinster Championship and stuff like that and, and hope that that can develop with it. And I think, you know, often you'll get players like that will revel as it, as it, as it steps up. And, and um, so that's what I'm saying. There is, it's understandable there's a lot of excitement around that. I just think, as I said at the outset, both on and off the field, I think we just need to... Up, we need to up the tempo a bit on all of this and and uh, as a collective and and build from it. But there's certainly huge positives around. I mean, it's, it's it's hard to find the negatives in that regard, other than that there isn't a settled team. And hand on your heart, is there a position on the field that you can say right now, well, he's definitely the goal. They're definitely going with Fahey or they're going with Murphy or they're going with who at full back. Um, we know, you know, probably 10 players that will be there come championship time. I don't think we know a single one of them, what position any of them, even those 10 would be in. And I know the modern game is much more fluid in it as well. And I, I'd be a bit more old school in the sense that you need to sort of nail down your central positions and your build your team around that or whatever. And I know that has moved on a bit from it as well, but you know, Limerick have moved around, but they tend to be a lot more settled. And let's face it, they're they're the benchmark for for everybody in this. But um, again, I'll go back to it, the next next few weeks will probably tell us an awful lot. And I think you'll get an awful lot more than seven hundred Galway supporters. You get more than that going to Thurles next Sunday because they know this will be this will be worth watching, and and they'll learn a lot from it. Absolutely, that's a huge game uh, to look forward to. We we will touch on that. Um in a couple of minutes but just there was kind of you talked there it was nearly I suppose when you were doing the interviews it was nearly like you were getting I suppose a lot of new content that you weren't aware of but Kevin Cooney was one that was dropped uh the news there about that he's a serious hamstring injury yeah yeah it wasn't dropped from the squad yeah thing. no not the, yeah the an news awful was blow. dropped yeah an awful blow because um on two counts like that as well he's been there been there like he he's he's been there thereabouts in the last few years. And same with John, his brother, obviously Joseph is as an established senior in the Goa team. But last year I thought was the year Kevin Cooney really nailed down a I won't even say nailed down a spot. And it was even something that Henry Shefflin uh, mentioned as well. He nailed down a position in attack, but had the versatility that they could move him around as, yeah. as need be, which must be absolutely invaluable and at any team or at any time, but certainly in the modern era where, you know, you have that con continuous movement in it. So, like, he was a nailed-on starter in the Galway attack this year, and now he may make the last bit of it. it like, I think Henry Shefflin summed it up when he said, look, if this happened two weeks from now, he'd be ruled out for the year. So what's he telling us? He's going to be back for an All-Ireland final if they get there you know, the, it, it, it's it that kind of it kind of seems like it could be similar to Jason Flynn's very much so, very much so. And I'm not a medic, but generally the history of hamstring injuries is surgery, which is not that common for that injury. But when it even when it does happen, hamstring injury by their nature are very difficult. It's not like a break or something like that, where there's a structure time aspect of it. It's 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 in the laps of the gods, really. And 
you know, you're sort of reading between the lines and you're sort of saying, if this guy's back for the club championship, fully fit for Sarsfields, that's probably the more realistic part mm. of it. Huge blow for him. Huge blow for yeah. him. Um, huge blow for, well, Sarsfields will have him back. But a, a big blow for Galway as well, because you could see, and you could see the, even the way Sheffield was speaking about him, he had a huge time from that. He had, he had him earmarked for, for a lot this year. Um, so to lose a player, lose that player, that quality, uh, this earlier in the in the year is a, is a big blow. And um, he had surgery last Friday, I believe. Hopefully that has been a success, and he, he makes the run the road to recovery in it. But it's it's horrible for any player at the outset of of a year, but particularly somebody that has sort of had that the big breakthrough year, as we might call it, last summer, and just when you're going to build upon it and. The excitement that'll be offered around that is to suffer something like that is a horrible, a horrible setback. It's a horrible setback, and I wish him well and hope he's, 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 he's back sooner rather than later in it. Um, you know, because he's an exciting player to watch as well. Yeah, even with that, we had um Alan Kearns on the podcast last year, and I asked him the question, "What was go his biggest positive in twenty twenty three?" And really, it was Kevin, as he said, it was Kevin Cooney's performances. Wow, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's. You could see it because I think it's always and I, I I played with I played with his father many many years ago and I think the one thing always about the Coonies even when they were at their brilliance you always felt there was even another layer to them even when they were with their clubs all the, the his uncles and that they were always looked like ones who were capable of stepping up to another level and you just felt that with Kevin last year you know that you know that he had a lot to build on this year and. Um, Hopefully, who knows? Maybe, maybe he will be one of the lucky ones and get back, you know, for the latter stages of the championship. It'd be a great boost for Galway to get somebody like that coming back to it. He loses a bit of ground as well at the same time. Like there's a, the rehab, the recovery of it is is sort of preventing that further progress. Happens, to, it's the it happens to all of them, unfortunately. Um, just I I just hope I just hope for him and for Galway. Um, that he that he makes a successful recovery first of all, and that he gets back to 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 build on that. But um, yeah, that's I think everyone could have done without that news. News. Yeah. Last. It was at a time when when they're trimming the panel as well. Um, there was four or five or six, seven players, I think. Seven, yeah. Uh, cut from it last week again. Um, I asked Henry at the end of it, and I apologize for putting him on the spot, but it's the only way. The only way we're going to find out is by asking the manager in that situation and it's the only way supporters are going to find it out if we go on and ask them. So uh, I think he was afraid he was going to leave a player out and that's understandable as well. But I just think that whole, I think that whole promotion and handling and their communications in, in GA teams in general, I, I think leaves an awful lot to be desired. I think if somebody's brought into a county team People should know about it if they're being let go from it from now. They should be as well. If you're announcing your captain, announce your captain. Bring him forward. Particularly I, I, because you, you, if you name a championship panel, it can't be that big of a deal to name a league panel because well, more, more than likely it stays the same. Or... Well, I, 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 he told us afterwards that there's 36 players in it. Yeah. And I was coming away from it and I was saying, well, I have 24 from this match programme. Uh, who are the other 12? I had a few definite nailed on with it as in Mannion and McInerney and all that. And then I'm trying to second guess who's in from Thomas's. Um, and the reality is I don't know. And and I'm, you know, you will not find that list of 36 players readily available on a website or notice board or whatever. So we'll have to wait till the next day and start counting through them. And this day and age, I think it's just an archaic way to do business, to be quite honest. Um if if somebody is in there, you know, maybe maybe there's a surprise person in that 36. I think it'd be lovely if people knew it. I think it'd be lovely if their clubs did. I know in the case I live in Salt Hill, I played with Salt Hill, I know they take such huge pride in Donald O'Shea lining out at midfield in National League match and Salt Hill and Nakara is beside him, his club in it or whatever. And and then uh, quality guy. Coming off the field the last day did his interview Os Gaelga was ready in the Gael that then kept going and didn't knock a a thing out of them high up or low down, you know, it's just well able to do, well able to do all of that. 
Yeah, from what I've heard with Thomas's lads, it's David Burke, uh, Finta Burke, Shane Cooney, Connor Cooney, and their goalkeeper, Jerk Kelly, has been drafted into the panel as well. So oh. that, that'll be an interesting one after. No, no room for the All Ireland final hero, the point well, of the year. I haven't heard anything now. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. It'll be not... interesting, like whether he's in or, yeah. or not. It's, it's, um, it's one of the most astonishing scores I've ever seen to win any match in any sport. It's um it's it I I somebody replayed it or somewhere social media went, wow, like when you look yeah. at it, it's all around that. And I, I if he's not there, he's not there. But again, it'd be nice if people knew it. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's um just from the players that were let go, uh, Henry Shefflin confirmed uh, in the interview after the game that Martin McManus, Craig Thomas, Alex Kinnear, Oshin Salmon, Adrian Prendergast and David Kincannon and Sean O'Hanlon have been let go from the panel. It's extremely difficult for those lads because they went in this year, all seven of those players who were let go, looking to kind of make their breakthrough and commit to this cause and in the end of January to be given that news like it, it's difficult for those players now. Yeah, in fairness two of them uh, Oshin Shaman, Salmon and Adrian Prendergast are injured okay. uh, there was injuries he, he clarified that part yes. but I wasn't aware of whether there was injuries with, with any of the others it is uh, at the same time you know the nature of the beast for the Walsh Cup extra players are brought in some are retained some aren't it's not as if they're cast away and and you know that's it um, the thing is, there's so little club action now because it's condensed that there's very little opportunity in this cycle of games um, to to be seen and to get that opportunity to go back in. Um, I think in some cases, some players would be, I think they'd be delighted to find themselves in January that they're at that level that they're being considered for it. And maybe, you know, they push on now either through... Um, Fitzgibbon or through club or into the club championships later in the year, um, you know, and that they're on the correct pathway, um, within that, um, you know, um, Sean O'Hanlon, I thought, you know, I, I, I hadn't seen all of the Walsh Cup runs, um, like I've no doubt if injuries arise, they're they're sort of the next, they're the next step coming back into it. It's difficult, but at the same time, I think, you know, nobody is in there in. In in um, a January competition, knowing the quality of players that haven't been recalled, and that everybody is going to be retained within it, so uh, you know it's it's not nice. We've all we've all been there. We've all thought we should have made the cut. Um, it doesn't it doesn't always happen. I was in a a minor squad that was cut by three, and I was one of the three in the last cut of it. I thought I'd made it, um, and didn't, and. Of course you feel you should. And of course what you're doing is you're looking at the names that are in ahead of you and you think, God, I, I thought it was ahead of him and all that. It's the nature of sport. And um it's it's of course it's not nice, but I I, I think equally guys know they're they they're, they're they are being noticed and will continue to be this year. And I think you know you would have seen it as well. Um and not not just this management team, but previous ones as well. They really do get around and look at at the club games and follow all of that. And um, you know, I often thought of it. This is going back many years, but gosh, they, they must never see home because they're 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 right there through it. So if if lads are putting their putting their hands up, I think they will they will get the opportunity. Um, but as you said, for those seven, or particularly the five that aren't injured, not what you want to be hearing. And um, hopefully they will channel that. To get back in there, um, and and you know go from there, go from there with it. That's that's what you're hoping for. Something else you touched on earlier that was revealed uh, after the game. Conor Whelan being confirmed as goal captain. I don't think anyone has kind of any argument with this. Uh, the performances he's given for goal over the last couple couple of years deservedly um, has him captain for twenty twenty four. Absolutely. And um he's been vice captain as well for the last few years. So it's not I just I just wonder I'm off I often find it difficult to find out what exactly is the role of a captain in Gaelic football or hurling. Um I'm quite clear what the role is in rugby. Um and it has quite clearly laid out roles 
on and off the pitch and the go-to part of it and leadership group and all that. I'm never I'm never quite sure where exactly it mm. sits. Why is a hurling manager, why does somebody, uh, why does a manager or a selector, why do they pick a particular person? Is it for something they're going to do in the dressing room? Is it for their style of play? Is it for their communication skills? Is it for the way they knit it together? And maybe it differs from county to county. Um, like, it's almost impossible to visualise Limerick without Declan Hannan being their captain. He seems the most natural person in it. He he talks Limerick hurling magnificently. I think he sets the tone and always has, not, not just when he won multiple All-Irelands, but he just seemed to set the tone um, when he's interviewed, when any of that, it just the, the way he carries himself right through. So you can see what John Kiley was looking for there. Like, what a goal we're looking for from Conor Whelan. Are they making him, he's been made captain in the hope he's going to produce more on the pitch. That would be a silly approach to take to him because he, he contributes enormously to it. So what exactly the role holds in Galway or any other team, I honestly not sure or not sure what they're looking for in that regard. There was no light shed on that on Saturday as to why he was chosen or to why Dahi Burke was relieved of it. I was thinking afterwards then, um, he's the first forward to captain the Galway hurlers, isn't he? In in recent years, um, I, I think you nearly do you have to go back to Joe Canning for for the last forward that was a Galway captain. Um, I've set you thinking now as well. <laughs> Uh, Cass and David Burke as a midfielder. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if there's any different dynamic in that or is Shefflin see more within that, but I'm not entirely sure what is expected of Conor Whelan as captain. What's what's he hoping it or is it maybe it's not as important? Uh, certainly the way they announced it and all that suggested it wasn't a very important role, to be quite honest. Um within Conor Cooney is vice captain. Um, does your vice captain start every match? Um, is he going to be a free taker as well? Does it, or are we reading too much into that? The reality of it is, is Conor captain Conor Cooney has been the most successful captain in Galway club hurling we've we've ever seen. I know back somebody did it before. Not all in the one go back in decades ago with, with Castle Yar. But for somebody to come through in the modern era and captain his club to six county titles in a row and lead on and off the pitch in the manner which he did, um, I think his role, like, they see absolutely no reason, more than Declan Hannon in Limerick, they see absolutely no, why would you change something that's working so well? Um, I often notice... Um, God knows we've watched him enough times lifting trophies, but he always seems to capture the moment in his in his post match speeches. He always just seems to nail where that team is and where they are at that point in time, and I think he just carries that part of it extremely well. So you can see the value in him being a Galway vice captain or indeed being a Galway Galway captain right through with that. But I'm maybe. People like us attach too far more weight to what the captaincy entails than within within the group itself. That maybe they don't uh, quite see it on on those levels. But I don't think you'll find a Galway supporter in the seven hundred there the last day, or the thousands that the other days would find any um, issue with the choice of captain or vice captain. I I don't know why. Dahi Burke, you know, do you just rotate this? Did he want it or not want it? Or we don't know. We can only we can only guess to that regard. But maybe maybe we're placing a bigger weight on what the captaincy entails in Galway Hurling than than it is in reality. I guess it was just a perfect step for to bring Connor forward as captain, particularly after last year, he was Galway's whole all star and deservedly so in, in 2023. Yeah, he's such an experienced player. I mean, he's, what is he, 27, I think, now. Um, he's heading into, I think, it's about his ninth season. Yeah, which is crazy to think of. Phenomenal, phenomenal. The, like He came through 2015, Anthony Cunningham produced him out of nowhere. If I remember correctly, he he was superb in a challenge match and they threw him in against, was it in against Cork? And, yeah, the quarterfinal, uh, yeah. And even the goal he got last Saturday. 
Like yeah. it was, I'm sure people who endured the traffic coming from the other side of town said, gosh, it was worth coming here to see that. I mean, it just, it's class, absolutely class. And he can do that against the best teams in the country as well, right through with it. And, um, you know, as I said, I think it's a big, you know, I think for a club, I think clubs should take enormous pride in one of theirs being asked to captain. That's why I just think it was an opportunity missed last week that they could have, they could have just built up a bit of momentum around his captaincy, a bit of momentum around the start of Galway's league campaign and just develop that from that because it's a good story. It's a good, it's it's not something to be heightened or doing any of that. And I, I don't think it'll probably make a blind bit of difference to his performance levels, which in fairness have always been extraordinarily high for Galway, consistently high. And he's a marked man when he goes out there as well, but he just has... He has the touches, you know, and it's it's um, it's you know again really looking forward to him next Sunday and going from going from there with it. But he's he's the go-to guy in the Galway forwards without a shadow of a doubt in that. So he's he's an armband as well, and and he can move move from there. Yes. Another key performance after his injury struggles last year. We have touched on a lot of positives, but Jason Flynn after just been injury uh, hampered last year. 2-2 two, two at the weekend. Uh, a big positive to have him back fit again. Absolutely. And it probably should have been 4-2. Yeah. Uh, and probably a bit more in it. He looks so fit. He really, really looks so fit. And you can only imagine, given the injury that we were talking about earlier and what he's set to contend with, you can only imagine the level of effort it has taken to get to that level of fitness and to work through it. And not like one thing doing it collectively, but I would imagine players like that have an awful lot of sacrifices to make privately to get back into all of that. And, you know, his his touch for the goal, all of that was was fabulous. His penalty was horridly poor. I, I'd have done better myself. <laughs> it, um, but he's he's sharp. And there's, you know, if you have... You know, the likes of O'Shea or the likes of, we'll say, Cahill Mannion when he comes back and stuff like that, or Gavin Lee feeding that sort of ball into a very big and very mobile uh, full forward. Um, but again, we need to we need to see it. It's temporary. We need to see it against Limerick, see where it is. But it's it, it, it's a very positive outlook <clears throat> and, and hopefully it can, it can be delivered upon. And, and uh, you know, hopefully the goal's start coming like these the few matches I've seen in Walsh Cup and everything like he could get a bag full at, at this stage he could be well into double figures for or beyond for, for the year so far and we're only five weeks into it Just something I want to touch on John before we look at the Tipperary game we did mention we can't take much out, out of that game really um, but there is positives there obviously with Goa's 31 point win but you've been at a lot of the games now between Walsh Cup and League. Are you beginning to see an Eamon O'Shea influence on this team yet? I I, I don't think so, to be honest. Um, I think where you will see the Eamon O'Shea influence will be in the likes of a Thurless, in the likes of those, at that higher level with it. Um, there's a good management team already in place with Galway coming up there. I think... I. I do you think there was a bit of there's a more short passing game being tried out there? Um, or is it just because you're playing weaker, weaker teams, there's a bit bit more space, there's a bit looser with, within that? It I definitely it definitely does feel like there's been an emphasis on diagonal balls into the full forward line from looking at it. Absolutely, but should not that yeah, I don't think you need to name O'Shea to come yeah. in to tell you the best way to open up. A, a hurling attack like even back when I was playing it was sort of you stayed in your position and it was man and man it was all diagonal right half back heads left half forward it's it's the most obvious way in it so I don't think you need Eamon O'Shea to come in to tell you this is the best way to go there I remember one time I'm trying to think who it was interviewing one of the Tipperary players and he, he in asking him to sum up the impact Eamon O'Shea had had, and I think it was back when he was the coach rather than the manager in the, in the first slot, and he said, he, he said, he, it just feels like he has a philosophy, take the goals and the points will come. <laughs> it 
it just seems look, goals win matches, and you got to find a way to get in there. And it's fine scoring twenty five or thirty points, but it's usually the one goal you get that'll make that difference in it, or the two or three or any of this sort of stuff. And I think that's where you will see his impact will be coming up towards that sort of. You know, you're going down you're going down the home track against Wexford or Kilkenny in the Leinster Championship and you need a big score and suddenly you'll see something like that, whether it's a rehearsed movement, whether it's just go with the instinct of it, um that you will that's when you'll say, Jesus, oh, you know, O'Shea has had an influence on on that. I think that's where it'll be that level, it'll be the top of the pyramid stuff. Um I think you'll see that impact, not Walsh Cup or one-sided yep. league matches. This year. Brilliant guy to have on board. Brilliant, brilliant guy to have. Anyone that's ever trained under him, played with him, played alongside him would, would tell you he just operates at a bit of a different level that makes all the difference come that. So you you have a very good, very, very good mix in, in that Galway management. So you have a lot of components in management, you've Johnny O'Connor now in doing all the physical stuff as well, and just even the impact and the experience he brings to all of that as well, and just a different voice and just a different uh, approach to it. Now I worked with Johnny and Connacht, and they have a seriously good guy in there as well, and and um, I just think he would bring a different emphasis and can bring both from Arsenal, with Galway and Isis is a lot of there, and you need that sort of mix of DNA within a group as well. And I, I think we see more more of that coming from that crossover from other sports. It has to be helpful. It can't be harmful. I don't I don't see where it could be. So you have a lot of a lot of components there and a lot to be excited about, I think, for Galway to be quite honest. We just need meaningful fixtures to start seeing how how much progress has been made. Are they lining up for a tilt? At Limerick, what is progress this year? Is is a Leinster Championship? What's progress for you? Uh, I think Leinster Championship is the bare minimum. I really, really do. You're into year three of a manager, into year three of the most successful hurler of all time. Uh, a league, a league is a league. It's certainly, I think Leinster Championship has to be the minimum. And, but I think by the time it comes to winning that, you will have a better indication of where exactly Limerick are. And that's the first thing everyone needs to find out is where have Limerick come back a bit closer to the pack or the moving out in it? And who else that guy uh, who else is moving? Um we've all seen the brilliant Cork underage teams and we're hearing the rhetoric of, you know, they're starting to come through. Actually I saw one of them brilliantly playing for Munster the other day of Ireland. It's um but so we've seen that in Galway. We've seen brilliant minor and brilliant on the 20 teams. Ad nauseum, there's no guarantee it's going to happen with a Cork. Will Tip come? Clare looked, looked the part yesterday, first week in February. Um, so I think by the time Galway get to that concluding stage of a Leinster Championship, we'll have a better idea of what else is happening around the country that will sort of dictate whether winning Leinster would be enough or whether you actually need really to have a right tilt at the All-Ireland in order to to see if the, what success is. If you have, we'll say, Tip Cork, Clare and Limerick flying it right through, maybe you're saying to yourself, Geez, you know, Leinster Championship would be a great year and consolidated more for, for next year within that. But I, at this point, you'd sort of say anything less than a Leinster Championship. And that's what makes that bloody late goal last year such a pity because... You would have got that. Yeah. You'd have set the bar at that level already, um, whereas that that hasn't hasn't quite happened. And you're probably going to be meeting the Kilkenny team uh, and a Wexford team that's come through a better league campaign in terms of the the quality of matches they have. But it's um, I suppose that's what we've to look forward to for the next next two months in particular. That's that's going to tell us a lot and see where we are. And that starts next Sunday in Thurles for for Galway. You know, that's that's the reality of it. You mentioned games to look forward to. I'm already excited by the prospect of this Sunday. It's the live game, obviously, on TG Carr as well, so for God fans who can't make it. But Amy O'Shea returning to tip 
the tip players were interviewed uh, against Dublin after a win over the weekend and they referenced that they underperformed against Galway last year. So that's still obviously at the back of their mind when Galway did dump them out in the All-Ireland quarterfinal. There's already a rivalry there. Now, I know it's early in the year, but there's like no matter when Galway um, tip play, there's always going to be a bite to it. Well, yeah, and I think particularly at the moment as well, because... The reality of it is, is that in terms of progress levels, Tip and Galway are probably in or around the same level. They've, they've genuine ambitions of provincial and beyond it uh, aspirations, and both of them justified in, in that regard. And it's, it's a big year for Liam Cahill as well in that. Uh, I don't think the Emma Shea factor, I don't think it's that big. Yeah. To be, but this is not Mickey Hart playing against Tyrone. <laughs> and like Eamon has managed to Pereira, he's coached them, he is. You know, big killer on McDonough man, but at the same time he's lived in Galway for the last 20 years, 30 years, or whatever. It's not, it's not, I don't think it's, you know, it's not that sort of level of going back in. It's not like John Kiley managing Tipperary to go playing against Limerick in a few years' time or something like that. Um, I think, like, there, I think he is huge. I don't think, I know he, he's hugely respected in his own native county, and they will be wondering what he is going to bring. To Galway in that regard, but I think Tipperary have more than enough to be worried about themselves and where their level of progress is at this year. Galway is one of their opponents, not their main one or anything like it. They're looking closer to home in terms of Munster Championship, first of all, Clare, Waterford, Cork, uh, Limerick. You know, there's, there's, there's only three of them coming out of it at the end of the day. Uh, Galway, they're in a different parish to them in that regard. Yes, first test, you know, they they, they fairly ran through Dublin on, on Saturday. Um, that was still a better level of, of opposition, the Tipperary place, than, than what Galway did. And they're in they're in Semple Stadium, and they've only a couple of games as well, so they need to make them count on it. Um, the Emin O'Shea thing will be there, but I don't I don't think it's major, quite a major factor in it. Um there's always been, as long as I can recall, there's a, there's always been a good, a good tip Galway rivalry, and at the moment I think they're probably both around the same level, and that that sort of adds to it. So whoever wins Sunday will get will get a decent lift out of it. You know, so there's a lot lot at stake in that. There's almost a, a lot of momentum that can kind of start to build with Galway this weekend to, to get a result down in tip against Turles because I think you have the break then and then they go to Antrim. Yeah, and if all of that happened, you were probably looking at then sitting on six points heading in facing Limerick and 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 Dublin. You're looking at potential league final. Um, you, you have all of that going in your favour. The reverse of that, you're going to Antrim with just two points under your belt. You're going up there uh, you know what you're going to get up in it. And um, there's certainly no guarantee of, of anything within that as well. So in terms of league part of it and momentum, there's another added part to that. I think over and above anything, performance is probably going to be more important next Sunday than the actual outcome. You know, if you get a, a good, fast, hard game and both teams are able to live with that, um course the outcome is important but not to that level of you know that there's a, there is still plenty of room to pick up the points at that you know i think what go down there and produce a flat performance and sneak a win at the end i think would be not the desired outcome in any shape or form it's it's you, you're getting one of the few high tempo games you're going to get before championship and i think that's both of them would want um both of them would want that Dare I say it? You probably need you need that from the outset. You probably you you probably need a a good row at the start, but probably wouldn't do any harm to just get the the blood going into get the get the tempo off that rather than go through the motions of a league match. But I think the billing of it, it's Sunday afternoon. It's there's, there's you know a lot of added part to that tip of obviously something from last year as well. That I I I think you'll get you'll get a different level of game. Um, and that's all the more reason that I think we'll be a little bit wiser by Sunday night as to where this whole um, 
group under under Henry Shefflin is actually is actually moving up what we might be looking forward to in 2024. At the moment, there's an awful lot of positivity to look forward to, but it's none of it is road tested. Um I think that that will change in Thurless on Sunday and, and hopefully it does. Hopefully it does. I just think we just need you just you need a bang to get into this season. You know, this there's a bit of going through the motions of Walsh Cup and one sided league games or whatever. And it, it, it needs a bit more. God, we need a bit more in it. And hopefully hopefully get the performance and get the win. Happy days if 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 all of that transpires. We've seen uh some more senior players come on uh the last day in that second half as as the game got going, Connor Whelan in particular. Still uncertainty whether it might be too soon for the Thomas's players next week because Shefflin did mention some of them have just picked up a few niggles. But do you expect to see more of the senior front runners back for Terrellist on Sunday? I, I don't, to be honest. Um on on two counts. One it's going to be a long year for, for the Thomas's lads right through in it. And particularly, you know, the likes of a David Burke and indeed the likes of a Connor Cooney as well. Um, I honestly think that if you're going to bring players in and play them in Walsh Cup and play them all that, you've got to keep the nucleus of that and see what, they can, what they're made of against a Tipperary or whatever. So I would imagine it won't be dissimilar to what actually played last weekend. I think you'll probably have a likes for Conor Whelan starting. Um, but I think I think you could see an awful lot of that starting 15. And I think you should, because you're really you're not going to know whether TJ Brennan is your long-term fullback unless you put him out in Thurless next Sunday. Like what message are you sending out if you leave him in the subs and you've to start the high bark and you're going for the win at like similarly the Don the the Gavin Lees, all of, you know. You got to give them the, dare I say, you got to give them the opportunity to fail, or you got to give them the opportunity to show they can cut it at this level, with it. Um. So I would, I would think, you know, you might see a couple of changes. Who knows what anybody picks up in Fitzgibbon this week or anything else like that. Um. But I think it'll be very similar to actually what played last weekend, and I hope it does because we we need to, we need to see these lads, you know, not cast them away and bring them back for the Antrim game and you know maybe where there's a handy one in Leinster or something like that go out and see you know see who the tall poppies are and, and see who blossoms in it so I I would think I would think Shefflin is looking forward to actually throwing them into the a bit in the deep end in that regard so I, I would think it'd be very similar to to uh, to last Saturday there's plenty hard in there after for for the Thomases, none of those, none of those Thomases lads that need to prove themselves. You know, maybe Gerald Kelly. I mean, that's a, I, I'm, I'm. You mentioned there if he's through in it, but you know the Fenton Burks, any of these kind of, they, they've nothing. You, you know what you're going to get from them when you do slot them in with it. So, you know, they're they're probably soon enough coming back towards sort of the Limerick Dublin part of it and into Championship um, from there. They're not they're not young lads either. You know and Fenton Fenton Burke would would be, but you look at his injury profile as well. You know he's he's recovered from serious injuries. Um, you're no need, and there is no need. Like you look at you look at what's there in that in that that squad at the moment. I I would think that as I said I could see Connor Whelan starting, and other than that, I think he could be going with a lot of what was out there last last Saturday. Yeah, particularly we had Finton on the podcast last week and he talked last year with Galway how he struggled with a hamstring injury for most of last year. So I don't think they're going to be taking any risks like yeah. that um, for the weekend. But Galway obviously facing tip now next in round two of the National Hurling League. That's 3.45 on Sunday, the game live on TG Carr. That's all we do have time for uh, on today's podcast. Thanks a million to John for coming on.